Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington. And with me here today is our special guest, Richard Tallheimer. He is the founder and former CEO of a company we all know, The Sharper Image. Richard, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Ted. Pleasure to be here. As we were talking the other day, or talking recently about um, what areas that we might dig into your expertise for our audience, one thing that really came to the forefront was an interesting thing that you certainly lived through through the course of starting and then growing the sharper image, which is, you know, you lived through the way the internet changed your business. So I'd love to, I'd love to understand the insights of what we could learn from the idea of how do we deal with emerging technologies? I mean, everyone's certainly comfortable with the internet now, but they're maybe not comfortable with blockchain or, or web 3.0 or any of the other things that might be impacting their business. So maybe, maybe take us to those days, when you were uh, experiencing this new thing of the internet and how'd you deal with it? Well, certainly um, times change and I do want to get your opinion on the metaverse, which is probably the next change people are talking about. But for just a quick glance back, it was about 95, 96. And I went to our board of directors and I said, you know, this internet thing is happening and I want to get the sharper image, which was a basically a gadget store at retail and a gadget online catalog. I want to get this on the web. And I never forget one of our directors turned to me and he said, Richard, people will never spend money on the internet or over the internet. <laughs> and I thought, wow, who could have uh, looked ahead and seen that Jeff Bezos was going to become the richest person in the world selling things using credit cards over the web. So anyway, they told me it wouldn't work. And I said, oh, we got to try it. And I said, you know, I've, I've heard of this new thing called Netscape. I want to get our, our first site up on Netscape. And our CIO at the time says, no, no, let, let's use Mosaic. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what Mosaic is. I've just heard about Netscape. So anyway, we eventually got it launched. It was small at first, but within three or four years, it grew quickly. And I think it's so fascinating that nobody could even conceive at the time that people would spend money on the web. Crazy. Yeah. So you certainly saw that that was a potential opportunity and you had a number of people in your way who didn't believe. So how did you overcome that resistance? I mean, was it as simple as you saying, look, I'm in charge this is what we're doing or did you build consensus? <laughs> How'd you do it? Well, I, th I think anyone in business learns that it's common people will say no, or they'll doubt your ability to make it work, because it's a little bit safer and more conservative to just say, you know, it probably won't work. Let's not try it. So you have to be a bold and innovative leader and not be afraid to fail your way to success. And by that, I mean, you try something as soon as you have a good idea. You don't risk the entire ranch on it. You try it, though. And if it fails, that's great. You can go on to the next thing that might work. Mm -hmm. But you have to be a, a strong, bold person to push it through. And I think, you know, my favorite example of that today is Elon Musk at Tesla, of course. He had so many doubters and so many moments when they could have gone out of business or bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, he's the richest person in the world. Right. Pretty crazy. Yeah, that's interesting, being bold and innovative and, and willing to fail. So let's talk about that a little bit, because that uh, I think every single person, no matter what industry they're in, what level they're at in their career, deals with this fear of failure. And it's uh, it's a common thing that we all understand that like, hey, failure is good. It helps us advance. How do we differentiate between the kinds of failures that are going to help us and the kinds of failures that might destroy us, especially when we see all failures as the kind that will destroy <laughs> us? I like the phrase uh, management by opportunity. And by that, what I mean is that you see an opportunity come along. So you decide to leap and try it. And it, it works, perhaps. And now you're moving right along in your career or your company. Or maybe it doesn't work. It fails. And you get rid of it quickly and you try something else. And certainly in my lifetime, we tried so many things. Some worked really well. Some didn't work so well. But you can't be afraid to fail your way to success. I like the way you just framed that, this idea of management by opportunity. There have been things in our business, certainly, where we we see this opportunity present itself and we're like, we got to go. Tr we have to try that thing. And then I look back on as I look back as I'm in the middle of these decisions saying, like, 
this feels a little too <laughs> like I'm flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> but in you know, the opportunity, it, it checks out when you think about why we wanted to do it. And some of them panned out and some of them didn't. So what is a good way for people to think about when those opportunities present themselves? How do you, how do you distinguish between, you, can, you drown in opportunities. How do you distinguish between the good ones and the bad ones? Well, there's different types of feedback. Um, one of them is, one type of feedback is the knowledge that you're gonna build as you investigate a new opportunity. That's your own personal knowledge about what's the chance this is gonna work. If it's a marketing effort or a product creation, a lot of it's going to depend on how people receive the new product. And what I've learned, this is sort of fun, is that if you will just informally talk to your friends, talk to your acquaintances, talk to strangers that you meet on a vacation or at a resort, and just say, hey, you know, I've got a sort of a little informal survey I'm doing. I'd like your opinion. Tell them about the app or the product or the service, whatever it is. And what I find is that after about the seventh person, all the patterns seem to become apparent. Hmm. You'll learn very quickly. If you ask seven people what they think of your new idea, you'll learn whether it's a good idea. You don't need a fancy, expensive consumer research survey. Just go ahead and ask people. Yeah. I like that too, especially because inherent in that is helping people, especially people who are innovators and uh, founders and aspiring entrepreneurs, will sometimes hesitate to want to talk about their idea because they think someone else is going to steal it. And the reality is people don't steal each other's ideas. I mean, yeah, I guess it happens occasionally, but it's all about execution anyway. Even if someone else stole your idea, you still have to execute it. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is talk about your idea because it will help you validate whether the idea is any good and then maybe find some holes in it, et cetera. And Ted, what you just said, I think is so important, which is having the idea is important you know that's an essential piece of it but the execution is really what makes it work and i've in my lifetime met a lot of people who said oh you know i could have been the sharper image guy i, I had an idea for a product once well they don't realize having the idea for the product is one thing getting it sold getting orders getting people to buy the app whatever it is buy the software that's the hard part i mean Larry Ellison and Oracle wasn't built just because he had an idea. It was built because over many, many years, they kept selling it to companies that wanted it. And the execution was everything. I like to think that I had the idea for Uber before Uber was an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, like, years ago, I was like, man, if only I could, I don't like this taxi cab experience. If I could just have a town car and it could just, like, come to me, but only when I need it. I don't want to have it all the time. And of course, like didn't you know didn't do anything with that, uh, and you know ride sharing has become an ama an amazing thing. That probably happens to people all the time because uh, someone executed it right. Execute an idea, having an idea is right. not cheap, but the execution is certainly important. Hey, just as a quick anecdote, I remember going to New York City. I live in San Francisco, but I go to New York City often for financial meetings, and we'd have to rent a car service for the day to get from office to office quickly. And they'd always have a three hour minimum. And so we maybe need the car on and off for six hours for the full day. And it was so expensive. And now you do that Uber ride for 15 to $60 instead of a $450 limo bill. Really interesting. Yeah, right. And then it's right there when you need it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so you've, by the sound of some of the stories you've been telling us, uh, you have an ability to uh, both surround yourself with people who are going to help you achieve the mission, even if they say no. Uh, and you're also going to find people who are not maybe necessarily part of the team on vacation, as you mentioned, at the resort, whatever. Uh, for those who are listening right now and they're building teams and they're trying to determine what should their counsel be, the people around them, what's the advice for how to find uh, the, the right kinds of people to surround yourself with? Well, that is a great question. So let me just throw out two thoughts. One is during the interview process. I'm looking for, personally, I'm always looking for people that are talking about what they can do for me or what they can do for the company or what they can contribute to the company. And what I'm generally avoiding is the people that are only asking questions about what's in it for them. I just haven't found those people make very good team players. If they're looking in the interview already for what's in it for them, that's not good. The other thing is once they're on board, what I found in my lifetime was you get two types of people. One type helps you solve problems. They simplify things, they save you time. The other person is the problem. The one that takes more of your time to watch them, supervise them, help them, 
they're taking more of your time than before you hired them. Hmm. Well, that's the opposite of what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And there's an interesting element to that too, that uh, probably a lot of people who have direct reports, I don't know if they learn it early or late, or maybe they never learn it, but is this problem where oftentimes a person will look to their superior for advice to make a decision on something. And what winds up happening is the superior knows exactly how to make the decision because they've done that for however many years. And so when they're asked that advice, they usually will say like, oh, do, do it version A, not version B. But that ultimately means that that person, the direct report, doesn't learn how to make the decision for them. And ultimately, the superior is not uh, saving time. So how do we help people in both sides of that equation, people who are the direct report and people who are the superior, pause to say, where do I not make the decision so that I can teach somebody else versus make the decision for them? Well, that's a great question because that's at the end why you're hiring people, right? Is you wanted right. them to save you time. And if you're gonna have to make all the decisions for them, you don't need them. Um, I once had a, a difficult employee and he kept saying to me, why are you micromanaging me? And my response was, if you would just do it, make the decisions and save me time, I wouldn't be micromanaging you. <laughs> That's a good frame, right? Yeah, I'm doing this because you are making me do this. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about um, coaching people or or figuring out how to find people who can coach themselves, what is the the biggest piece of advice you could give people for that part of building a team, right? We have to be able to teach people. Um, how do we do it? What's an effective way to coach people? Well, generally in my lifetime, I've always taken the approach of leaving people alone. So I'm not like Steve Jobs, where it's always written that he used to really micromanage every little tiny detail. I mean, I think he's a much more successful entrepreneur and business person than I've ever been, for sure. But he really irritated people by micromanaging them so much. So I, I say, hire somebody competent, leave them alone. And if you find yourself needing to jump in and micromanage them, that's probably a sign you chose the wrong person. And that's a whole other part of the problem, which is once you identify somebody isn't performing or isn't helping, how do you get rid of them? And, and I personally must confess, I've had the failing in my lifetime. I probably let people stay on too long once they pass that point. And in the emotion that I've experienced many times is you keep agonizing, gee, should I let them go? Should I tell them to find another career path? They'll be more successful elsewhere. Well, that's fine. And once they're gone, what you say to yourself is, oh, this worked great. I should have done this months ago. Yeah, what was, what was I waiting for? Yep. Especially if that person maybe is a high performer, but they're a bad culture fit, or maybe they're a great culture fit, but they're a bad performer. Uh, both of those wind up being difficult situations to terminate people. I share the same de uh, deficiency that you just described that I tend to hold on to people longer than uh, than I should. And as soon as you get rid of them, you're like, oh, that was, <laughs> I'm glad we're on the other side of this now. So how do you, how do you think through that? I mean, I, I heard someone describe the sort of framework the other day as uh, there were these three T's. I think it was when you find yourself in that situation, one option is to terminate. Uh, another option is to train the person or the team, whoever the problem is the problem, the person that needs to be trained, or is it their team around them needs to be trained. And then the third T was uh, to tolerate. And that's actually what most people do, do is they, they're like, the easier thing is to do nothing. So I'm just going to tolerate this poor performance or poor culture fit. Um, how does that resonate with you? Are there, is there a better way to think about it? Well, it's funny you brought that up because as we approach this session, I was thinking about our first CIO. A young guy, he was about 28 at the time. He was a brilliant programmer, but he was just a spoiled person. He didn't play with the team. He threw tantrums. He was difficult. And we couldn't get rid of him because he had the keys to the, to the software in his head. And he wasn't sharing them with anyone. And so we were in a difficult position. We put up with this guy. Eventually, the strategy I used was to continue to build up the team around him and to make sure that we had the keys in everyone's head, not just his. And then we let him go and we were so thrilled. But what it taught me was you can't be dependent on one person who's the only one that really understands the systems. 
most people don't have that problem because they're in bigger companies. But when you're starting up, you, you know, you've got just the bare bones crew. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think even in big companies, people have that problem too, because there's so much more politics in larger companies and people protect their uh, job security by ex doing exactly what was described here, where they make themselves uh, very difficult to replace. And um, yeah, so certainly building that redundancy is, uh, is key, not only to get rid of bad performers, uh, when you need to, but also to make sure that the organization becomes a self-sustaining thing that's not dependent on any individual person. Definitely. And and since we're talking about the word termination, I want to make it clear. I'm not particularly a hard ass. I put up with people too long. I don't yell at people ever. I never belittle or use sarcasm. I mean, I think it's really important to be polite. And we had a big enough company. At the end, we had 4,000 employees. So we followed protocols like, for example, Give people a written warning if you're dissatisfied with their performance. Give them a second written warning. Give them a third written warning, and then you can terminate them, but not until then. And I never use the kind of approach. And again, my idol, Steve Jobs, was just known for belittling people, you know, really ridiculing them and insulting them in person in front of other people. If you're going to put somebody down or criticize them, rather, do it in private. So praise in public, criticize in private, right? I believe in that for sure. So let's talk about, we've been talking about, you know, poor performers or poor culture fits, but let's talk about the good, good performers and good <laughs> culture fits. How do we, uh, people always talk about like, you, you need to identify potential. And I think anyone who ever joins any organization is like, I hope they see the potential in me. So how do we identify potential in people? Well, again, I'm repeating myself, but I start off by finding people in the organization that are solving problems and making life easier for everyone else. Those are the ones that I want to advance, the ones that reduce the workload for me and for other people. And then you've got a slight problem that you've got somebody above them who might be intimidated or you know threatened by this younger employee's rise. So what for me worked was to change titles. So maybe... The, the person who was head of a picket apartment now is going to be head of a similar division or a similar title, but it's going to be slightly different. And by doing that, I'm freeing up this uh, space in the organization to let the new person rise up without threatening the person directly above them because I moved that person slightly aside by a shift in organization. Now, that's a really fascinating way to think about it. So now, Right, because no matter how large the organization is, you have that sort of linear problem where a high performer needs to essentially take their boss's job, and if their boss doesn't move, then what does that mean? So you're exactly. saying create the lane by moving the block to a different yep. lane. Hmm. That's that's really and, fascinating. Yeah, and sorry, the person on top who's being somewhat usurped by the younger employee, they may be a little bit bit out of shape, so you might need to give them. Uh, a nice consultation that reassures them how valuable they are to the company. If you could give them a slight raise because they're maybe due for one, that'd be very nice also. That would really smooth the feathers. Hmm. But you got to get them out of the way so the new person can take over. Right, right. Yeah, you don't want a, a high performer held up simply because of the architecture of the team. Right, and you might lose the high performer if you don't give them career advancement. Right, right. So to what extent do you think age plays a factor in this? One of the things I think that's really beautiful right now is that no matter how young someone is, they have opportunities. No matter how old someone is, how old someone is they have opportunities. Uh, but people still see age. Ageism is a real thing. How do we deal with this problem and combat it? It's funny you should say that. You know, when I was starting the Sharp Rimage, I was in my 30s, late 20s, early 30s. And back then, your company really had to have earnings in order to go public. You had to have a solid record in order to go public. And nowadays I see young people become billionaires overnight, right? Mm -hmm. With companies that don't even have any earnings. So I start off by being jealous. Yes. <laughs> 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 Getting back to your question, ageism. Wow. It's a young person's world nowadays. What specifically can we address about that? Oh, and I don't want to let this interview end without getting your take on the metaverse and Facebook and what's going on with that. Sure. Well, yeah, we can. Let me. Well, well let's come back to that in one second. I'll ask you. We'll talk about metaverse. Um, yeah, I guess the question really was uh, around, especially 
people who are younger in their careers who might be at sometimes maybe held up because they're they only have a certain number of years experience and it's often praised as like this was really brave to give this you know early 20 something early 30 something this really big job uh how do we make sure that we're not in implementing these barriers like in it, it's a very pro serious problem in cybersecurity where we say things like entry level jobs require five years experience it's like that's not an entry level job then um how do that's really what the question i was, I was trying to get at is how do we solve that problem for security professionals um but i was trying to zoom it out because i know you're not from security but when we think about these barriers that we sometimes put in place for required years of experience uh how should we think of should we think about that differently and if so how do we do it well you're catching me by surprise because i honestly didn't realize that in cybersecurity, for example um hiring requirements are that strict about age needing five years experience i'm i'm surprised honestly i didn't think that existed yeah they're not all like that but this is definitely one of the big gripes that those of us in the security community are advocating against uh and companies are starting to figure it out and realize oh yeah maybe maybe that's not what we should be doing um <laughs> but it still exists it's pretty rampant actually people will say things like you know for entry-level roles you need a master's degree or you know equivalent years experience and it's like that's What's someone to do with that when they're right out of college, you know? So, um, yeah. Well, I want to, I want to say for me personally, my hiring, and I was always involved in the highest level executives. And at the beginning, I was involved in everybody. My hiring was never particularly based on college degrees or experience because as an entrepreneurial business, and ours was the, the essence of an entrepreneurial business, meaning it's small, you know, had to make it happen every day. It wasn't funded by some venture capitalists. We were living in our own cash flow. I really valued people who talked to me in the interview about what they knew about the subject matter and what they could do to help the company grow or protect the company from threats. And I couldn't care less what degree they had or what college. I went to Yale College. I couldn't care less whether you went to Yale or any other Ivy League college. So that's my approach. And I think there's other successful executives that have the same approach. That is a disregard for formal training and a preference for on the ground training. I like that. So let me, well, we could talk about metaverse. So let me ask you a question about your question so that we can talk about yeah. it uh, effectively. Um, what made you want to ask that question here? Here okay. you are, you know, you're, you're a very successful business person. You're an investor now. Um, are you asking this question because you see the opportunity or, or is it because you're like, what made you want to ask about that? I'm very- All intrigued. right, I'll, I'll focus the very sharp pencil here for you, Ted. Um, since leaving my business career about 2016, so now it's been what, eight years, six years, I really focused on my investments and I've been very successful investing. And one of my favorite stocks is Facebook. Meta and Mark Zuckerberg is one of the people I admire the most. And yet, you know, he had a great idea. Then he had some more great ideas like buying Instagram, but what is the next great idea for Mark Zuckerberg or is he sort of past having great ideas? That's an ageism question here. And you're much more akin to this subject matter than I am. So I wanna hear your opinion. Well, that, that's a really fascinating question because I would have to sit in a lot of rooms with Mark Zuckerberg to be able to answer whether or not he's passed his great ideas. My guess is there are probably endless ideas that come out of that guy that <laughs> get shut down because they're too like in in the clouds, you know, just too, too far ahead of his time. Um, I don't know. I mean, you look at the way that uh, anyone creates ideas, right? The... Um, people are some people are full of ideas some people are full of execution some people are a combination of the two uh, facebook has undeniably succeeded over a very long period of time based on their ability to execute on their ideas so i would be hard pressed to imagine that mark zuckerberg and the team that's around him is out of ideas um i look at the metaverse and i see it as something that is not yet its version of what will be the successful thing it's like, here's this cool idea, and it's like this mushy potato. How is it going to someday become a crinkle-cut French fry? 
<laughs> and I don't know what the crinkle cut French fry is, but I know there's a potato on the table. And so that's the part that's got me really interested. Like will people buy and sell real estate in an alternate universe and that becomes like the way we all interact with people in the future? I think probably not, but the novelty of it is getting people thinking, is getting other entrepreneurs thinking and that those kinds of opportunities I think are undeniable. Wow. Sounds like you're somewhat optimistic that he's onto something. They're spending 10 billion a year, supposedly, according to the press, researching this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something there. And when you're spending that kind of money on something, there maybe there's even more to it than we see. Uh, the security guy in me sees yeah. like this is just another way to get my data. <laughs> but uh, yes. there's there's probably you know some truth in that. Um, but yeah, you look at all these different aspects to what Facebook has become. I mean, the core product of Facebook, that is going to die. People don't want Facebook anymore. Younger generations don't even sign up for it anymore. Um, it definitely is something people look at and they're like, you have Facebook. It's like having a Hotmail account right now. Yeah, or <laughs> AOL.com. Or AOL, yeah. So Facebook <laughs> has to move on. And But that's the truth. I mean, you probably experienced it in your business, right? Where yeah. there were aspects of the business where what you started with, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, now all of a sudden it's like, we have to move away from that, right? Was there an example of something like that? Well, I think the most obvious example is I grew up in an age of paper catalogs. We actually lived and died by selling products printed on paper. And nowadays, I don't even want a paper catalog to come to my home, right? <laughs> right, right. And I've pretty much reduced all of them to, to not being mailed to me. And I'm shocked that I give money to an organization or a charity or buy a product. And before I know it, they're sending me paper mail. It's like, don't do that. Right. <laughs> it's not good for the environment. And I don't want to look at it anyway. It's all online. Right. And the, so, the cost and effort, like why? Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny that I grew up in an age, which you don't remember, when people live for those 20 or 30 mail order catalogs that came at Christmas. Right. Yeah. What a substantial change that, that you experienced for sure. And and being able to see that change come around the corner, you know, not, uh, you know, it's funny talking about paper and it makes me think of for anyone who's ever watched, you know, The Office, which is all about uh, one of the funny lines in there is like, how do you adapt to a uh, being a paper company in a paperless world, right? And it's like, <laughs> you weren't a paper company, but you were originally reliant on paper and you had to move on. Well, as our uh, as our time comes to a close here, Richard, uh, first of all, appreciate all the wisdom and insight. I have so many notes and things I'm going to take back to my business from what what you shared with us today. Is there any parting wisdom or anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure we oh. did uh, talk about before we leave? Well, I do want to encourage people to go to this website, thesharperinvestor.com, thesharperinvestor.com. That's my little website. I do a blog about once every two weeks. It's mostly about stocks, investing, making money for yourself. And a lot of it is tech companies, of course, because that's the area of the NASDAQ that I really follow closely. And this is a unique opportunity in our history to make money because some of these stocks are so beaten down. They're all off 20, 30, 40, 50% from their year's high. So for your followers who are investors, this is a really interesting time to consider investing. And I give you my free 25 pro trading tips just by throwing your email into the sharperinvestor.com. I love it. I'm going to go check that out right after this. Yeah, definitely. When uh, things are retracting the way they are right now, everyone gets scared. But that is the time to buy, certainly when things are dumping. Oh, so Warren Buffett was so smart. He's one of the world's richest men. He said, be fearful when others are greedy, when others are greedy. And be greedy when others are fearful. Well, everyone's fearful right now. The NASDAQ has just been pummeled. This is a great opportunity to buy low. Remember, buy low, sell high. Yeah. You got to do it in that order. You got to buy low. Yeah. This is the time. Totally. It's really interesting seeing that in the contrast to to the real estate market kind of feels like everyone's greedy right now. So maybe that's a time to be fearful uh, in real estate and focus resources into, into the stock market. This is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. <laughs> so, all right. Well, Richard, thank you so much for your time today. You've been awesome. Thank you, Ted. Great conversation. Totally. For everyone else, if you want to learn about what Richard is up to or request to appear on the podcast yourself, just go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we'll catch you next time.